The slumbering volcanic peak of Mount St. Helens. In its shadow, one of America's most beautiful national forests. A magnet for vacationers seeking the great outdoors. But then, without warning, the volcano erupts. In just four minutes, the blast flattens 220 square miles. Huge mud flows surge down 150 miles of river valleys. 57 people die. With all eyes on the mountain, why did no one predict such a catastrophic eruption? Now, using advanced computer simulation, we reveal why the Mount St. Helens blast took everyone by surprise. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events, unravel the clues, and count down those final seconds from disaster. The American Northwest, Washington State, Mount St. Helens. At nearly 10,000 feet, the spectacular volcanic peak crowns the Pacific coast. Beneath Mount St. Helens, just 100 miles from Seattle, lie almost 2,000 square miles of national forest and a network of three rivers fed by meltwater from the volcano's snow-capped peak. It's a picture postcard setting, a vacationer's paradise. The region pulls in half a million visitors a year. Then, on March 27, 1980, at 12.36 p.m. We are directly over Mount St. Helens right now, and there is no question at all that the volcanic activity has begun. Mount St. Helens spews smoke and ash higher than a mile into the sky. The volcano has woken up from a 123-year sleep. Excited by the prospect of more eruptions on their doorstep, thousands of spectators flock to the area. But scientist David Johnston from the U.S. Geological Survey, or USGS, is worried. He's been fascinated by volcanoes since the age of 18 and thinks that this eruption is an indication of something larger to come. He goes on TV to warn the public of the danger. Could be within hours, it could be within days, or, or even up to a couple of months. This is not a good spot to be standing. <laughs> Johnston is only 30, but he's already a highly respected volcanologist. Local county sheriffs heed his warning. They immediately close public roads and highways within about seven miles of the summit, and they force local residents and sightseers to evacuate. March 29th, two days later, the volcano is quiet. But a news camera crew spots a newly formed crater on the mountain's summit. When USGS scientists see the images, they know that internally, the mountain is waking up. They devise a map to highlight areas that will be affected in the event of a large eruption. They base it on the worst eruption the volcano has ever produced, a classic vertical blast. The map includes areas that will be directly affected by the blast, as well as 150 miles of river valleys that will be affected by lahars, giant mud flows caused by rapid snowmelt at the volcano's peak. 
be consistent with the pattern that the summit is expanding, is inflating. The finished hazard map identifies large areas of state, forestry commission, and privately owned land, all at risk. But the USGS is an advisory body and has no power to enforce land closure. Now, the U.S. Forestry Commission takes action. They set up two restricted zones on their land based on information supplied by the USGS. The inner red zone is the most hazardous area. Its boundary extends up to seven miles from the summit of the volcano. Only the police and scientists are allowed in here. The outer blue zone is less dangerous. Its boundaries are up to 15 miles from the volcano. The public is banned, but logging company employees have access. Outside of these two exclusion zones, the public can still go into large areas deemed hazardous by the USGS, including land and river valleys at threat from lahars. Saturday, May 17th, 1980. For seven weeks, the U.S. has been watching Mount St. Helens sputter. The big one has yet to happen. But the waiting game makes national news. There are rumblings of something big about to happen in Washington State. The eruption of Mount St. Helens. Then... As quickly as it started seven weeks earlier, Mount St. Helens falls silent. To some, it feels like the big one won't happen after all. With a hot and sunny forecast, hundreds of people from towns and cities make spur of the moment decisions to head out to the countryside. Among them are two mill workers, 19-year-old Danny Balch, and his 20-year-old friend, Brian Thomas. Danny is aware of the news reports on Mount St. Helens, and he's worried about going too close. I still was pretty well convincing Brian to go to the beach. I didn't want to go up there. I was pretty sure something would happen. But Brian convinces him otherwise. They meet up with four friends and set up camp near an old log cabin seven miles from the outer blue zone. Danny begins to relax when he sees that two high ridges stand between them and Mount St. Helens. The fine weather also brings out a young couple. Sweethearts Venus Durgan and Roald Wrighton are looking forward to a weekend of camping in the great outdoors. By the time we got there, it was maybe noon, and it was like 85, it was great. So we set up a little camp and, and uh, fish and just camp for the weekend. Build a fire, you know, it's like, do what kids do. Roald is taking few chances. He chooses a camping spot more than 25 miles outside the blue zone and 33 miles from the mountain. He and Venus are at a bend on the Toodle River, one of three rivers fed by meltwater from Mount St. Helens. The center of the mountain was 33 miles from where I was camped. I mean, we didn't go down there to see it, be around it or anything. Like we, it wasn't even in the back of our mind. This far outside the exclusion zone, Roald and Venus feel completely safe. But at a spot just six miles from Mount St. Helens, deep inside the red zone, USGS geologist David Johnston is monitoring the volcano. It's supposed to be his weekend off, but he's covering for a colleague. Johnston sees it as another opportunity to study Mount St. Helens, the volcano that's fascinated him since high school. 
He's here to monitor a mysterious rock bulge that appeared on the volcano's north face four weeks ago. As he takes his readings, Johnston confirms that the bulge is growing fast. It's now nearly 450 feet long and 100 feet high, and it grows five feet every day. Other USGS scientists think the bulge is just another sign of an impending big vertical eruption. But David Johnston disagrees. Based on his research, he thinks that Mount St. Helens may erupt in a far more deadly way. Sideways, in a lateral blast. 7 p.m. Rold and Venus prepare their dinner. Fish caught that afternoon in the Toodle River. And Danny, Brian, and their four friends crack open a few beers by the campfire. They're looking forward to a great weekend in the National Forest. A weekend they'll always remember. Sunday, May 18th, 1980. A hot, sunny weekend sends vacationers into the National Forest land surrounding Mount St. Helens. 8 a.m. 7 miles outside the blue exclusion zone, Danny Balch, Brian Thomas, and four of their friends begin to stir. Some of them are awake, but Danny and Brian are still asleep in their tent after a heavy night of drinking. 8.15 a.m. Scientist David Johnston continues to monitor the growing bulge on the north face of the volcano. He's in the dangerous red zone, just six miles from Mount St. Helens, where only scientists and police have access. For the next four hours, he'll record and transmit his findings to colleagues at USGS headquarters in the city of Vancouver, Washington. Then he'll be off duty and can meet his girlfriend for the weekend. 8.22 a.m. 27-year-old graduate student Keith Ronholm wakes up. He's been interested in Mount St. Helens since it started showing signs of life seven weeks ago. Keith is 10 miles to the northeast of the peak, outside the red zone and he has an unobstructed view of Mount St. Helens. Thought I'd get to go see a plume of steam and ash rising five to 10,000 feet above the summit. It would be pretty impressive and I could say, wow, I've seen a volcano erupt and then I could ignore it for the rest of the summer. But Mount St. Helens is quiet. There was no hint of impending activity. There was no steam clouds. There were no ash clouds. So I actually rolled over and took out my novel and started reading. At 8.32 a.m., Keith hears shouting from other sightseers. My first thought was, oh, they're yelling at their kids to come to breakfast, get away from the cliff, don't feed on your brother, that kind of thing. I said, oh, I'm near a mountain, maybe I should take a look. As he does, he sees the entire north face of the mountain, including the rock bulge, sliding down. Not flowing, not sliding like a solid block of material, but flowing like it had turned to jelly. I went, oh, I'm going to get to see an eruption after all. Then, at 8.32 and 47 seconds. Mount St. Helens explodes. A huge billowing cloud of hot gas and ash blasts out. But it doesn't shoot up through the mountaintop. It bursts out from the mountainside. 
the lateral blast head straight towards USGS scientist David Johnston. He's in the red danger zone, so there's no time for him to run. He sends a radio message to base. Then the transmission stops. The blast continues to expand, and next in line is Keith Ronholm, who's been taking photographs of the eruption. At this point, as it started to come over that ridge, I started to think that maybe it was time to get out of there. Keith floors the accelerator and tries to outrun the blast cloud racing towards him. Eight thirty-three and fifty-eight seconds. More than fifteen miles from Mount St. Helens, outside the blue zone, a rumbling noise wakes campers Danny and Brian. I don't know if something, an uh, earthquake or anything actually woke me up, but I just woke up out of a dead sleep, and I just go, Brian, let's get the hell out of here. They scramble out of their tent, but the blast of volcanic cloud engulfs them. As it hit, it just knocked me flat to the ground. It was just such a heavy force. And then all of a sudden, I could feel myself starting to shrivel up like a prune. Then I could feel myself starting to burn. As the cloud disappears, Danny sees a scorched and blistered landscape. He's badly burned by the blast, yet his first thoughts turn to his friends. I was wondering where everybody's at. There's five other people within shouting distance. You know, nobody's answered me. I was beginning to think I was the only one alive. 8.42 a.m. After searching for five minutes, Danny finds his friend Brian buried under some fallen trees. Brian reached up with both his hands at that time, and I went to pick him up, and he started screaming his leg, his leg, his leg. And I reached down to his wrist and grabbed a hold of both of his wrists and told him, I gotta help you get out of here right now. Danny frees Brian and starts to carry him to a nearby log, but his four other friends are still missing. And it was at that point the ash started falling. And at that point, within a matter of a few seconds, I could not even see Brian's back of his head, which was only inches in front of me. 10 a.m. 1 hour and 27 minutes after the eruption. More than 25 miles outside the blue zone, childhood sweethearts Roald Wrighton and Venus Durgan are fishing. Mount St. Helens is 31 miles away, out of sight and earshot. The young couple is unaware of the major eruption. Then they hear the sound of a warning siren from a nearby logging company. Rold looks around to see what's causing the alarm. The old growth trees up around the bend, we could see them shaking. Shaking, and you could just like see dust coming off them, and you could hear them snapping and falling down. It was like a monster coming through the forest. We didn't know what was going on. A wide torrent of mud, water, and trees head straight towards them, smashing the forest on both banks of the river. Roald and Venus sprint to their car. It was a beat car, man. I was like, you know, I didn't like to start all the time. And I was like, God damn thing, I'm cussing it, you know. And she's going, come on, come on, come on, you know. And it wouldn't start. 
The torrent engulfs their campsite, forcing Roald and Venus to abandon their car and dive into the swirling mass. I landed on a big log. I saw Venus drop right by me and she went right in between them. And I swallowed her up, gone. Roald shouts for his girlfriend, but Venus has disappeared under the deluge. May 18th, 10, 10 a.m. Mount St. Helens has been erupting for one hour and 37 minutes, covering 220 square miles with ash and rock. Mud and trees surge down the river valley. The deluge separates a young couple, Roald Wrighton and Venus Durgan. The big log would go up and just, whoa, cascade right over. Bam, 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 right next to you. I was sure I was going to die. Roald clings desperately to a log, but he can't find his girlfriend, Venus. Then he spots something in the water. Venus! All of a sudden, I saw her arm sticking up. Just her hand. Grabbed it and hung onto it, pulled her up as hard as I could, hung onto her for a while, I got her all the way out. The, the current carries the exhausted campers five miles downriver before it subsides. Rold pulls Venus up onto the bank. 10 12 a.m. After 90 minutes, the ash falling on Danny Balch and Brian Thomas starts to subside. And it was at this point that Bruce and Sue started walking up to us. Two of Danny's friends have survived the eruption unscathed. Together, they carry Brian to the log cabin in the campsite and make him comfortable. Two other friends are still missing, and Brian is in great pain. His leg has been crushed, and he can't walk. Danny knows that he needs a doctor. I told Brian that I had to get help for him. He didn't want me to leave, but I knew I had to. If I had sat there with Brian, I, I probably would have went into shock. He promises Brian he'll be back and sets off. By 10.30 a.m., hundreds of rescuers from the Forestry Service, state troopers, National Guard, and Mountain Rescue are searching for survivors in the blast area. We went in just hoping that maybe somebody would be in a, a cave or a cliff or behind a mountain or possibly maybe there'd be somebody still alive in the blast area. National Guard pilot Jess Hagerman flies in from Fort Lewis, 65 miles from the blast zone. 11.29 a.m. Geophysics student Keith Ronholm survives the initial blast of the volcano but hot ash still showers down. As the downpour starts to lessen and visibility improves, he slams his foot on the accelerator. Eleven thirty a.m. National Guard pilots spot two survivors staggering from the forest. Rold and Venus have survived. The rescue team makes a hazardous landing, the rotors of their helicopter cutting the air just feet from the trunks of trees. Once Rold is on board, the pilot gives him a bird's eye view of the volcano. He goes, hey, you want to see what almost killed you? And he just spun the helicopter right around. Like, and there it was. Like the mountain was venting was going straight up. And it was just like a huge 
steam locomotive like thousands of feet up. Five PM Eight and a half hours after the eruption, helicopter pilots are still working. They find Danny Balch. Two of his friends, Bruce and Sue, have already been rescued. But two others, along with Danny's friend Brian Thomas, are missing. An hour later, at 6 p.m., they discover Brian dragging himself through the mud, not far from the shattered camp. As night falls, over 100 people are in nearby hospitals. Among them is Venus Durgan, who has lost 60% of her skin. Her boyfriend, Rold, has fractured feet and severe skin abrasions. Danny Balch suffers second-degree burns to 20% of his body. And Brian Thomas has a shattered hip. Rescuers deliver tragic news to Danny and Brian. Their two missing friends didn't make it. Their bodies were found huddled together in their tent, crushed by a fallen tree. In all, 57 people die in the Mount St. Helens eruption. They're the first recorded volcano victims in the continental United States. Yet 53 of those 57 victims die outside of the red and blue danger zones in places that the USGS and state said were safe. How did the experts get it so wrong? The consequences of the Mount St. Helens blast radiate as far away as Oklahoma. In less than five hours, volcanic ash covers three states, and within 15 days, winds push the ash around the globe. In the aftermath of the eruption, the United States Geological Survey organizes 70 scientists to investigate and uncover why so many people died. And now, Using the evidence from that investigation and rewinding the events leading up to the blast, we can reveal what really happened at Mount St. Helens. Advanced computer-generated simulation will take us where no camera can, inside one of North America's most active volcanoes. The eruption of Mount St. Helens on May 18, 1980 is the first volcanic eruption in the continental United States since 1917. Around the world, the science of volcanology is still in its infancy. Geologist Dan Miller is a key member of the USGS investigation team, and he knows they face a steep learning curve. We had never dealt with a volcanic eruption in our lifetimes in this country. So we were basically building a boat and rowing it at the same time. His team calculates that the energy released by the blast must have been 24 megatons, over 1,500 times more powerful than the atomic blast at Hiroshima. Investigators want to see inside the blast zone, but they know a second eruption is possible. Team volcanologist Richard Waite is one of the first USGS investigators to fly over the devastated area. 
He's shocked by the scale of the Mount St. Helens blast. I just couldn't believe it. I hardly believe my eyes. Yet there's the evidence um, that it did happen. The blast leaves Mount St. Helens 1,300 feet shorter. And in place of its peak, a giant crater, almost a mile wide and 2,000 feet deep. But that's not the main thing that catches the investigators' attention. What surprises them is the area destroyed by the blast. It stretches almost 19 miles to the north and west of Mount St. Helens. But the south and east are practically untouched. Which means it couldn't have been a vertical eruption. If it was, the blast zone would radiate out evenly, causing damage all around the mountain. I didn't have any idea what the heck had happened um, that could have been so destructive. The team knows the 12 seismographs were scattered around the mountain at the time of the blast, but none of them transmits data. They only record data on site in the field. After such a massive blast, the chances of finding any seismographs at all, let alone any that still work, are slim. Nevertheless, five days after the eruption, investigators organize a search to find them. Meanwhile, investigators examine photos taken by survivors. One set, taken by geophysics student Keith Ronholm, proves vital. His photos capture the first moments of the eruption from just four miles away. The sequences of photographs of the eruption of May 18 are incredibly important for scientists because for the most part, during the day uh, of May 18, most of us who looked towards Mount St. Helens could see nothing but a veil of ash um, and dust which obscured whatever was going on around the volcano. They confirmed that the blast wasn't vertical. Instead, the blast burst through the side of the volcano laterally, a scenario most scientists had dismissed. The blast itself was, was something that had never been seen before. It was on a scale not, not measured either at St. Helens or anywhere else as far as I'm concerned. Investigators need to find out why Mount St. Helens erupted so abnormally, laterally, instead of vertically. Investigator Dan Miller examines the data gathered by scientists in the weeks leading up to the blast. From the moment of the first volcanic activity, seven weeks before the deadly blast, USGS scientists believe that any major eruption would be a conventional vertical one. Why? They know that beneath Mount St. Helens, there was a vast underground chamber of magma, and after being stable for over 100 years, it was growing. Historically, scientists expected the magma to rise via a conduit in the center of the volcano, only stopping when it hit a rock flood left by previous eruptions. As the pressure built, the magma would eventually blow out the plug like a champagne cork. The result? A classic vertical eruption. But then, four weeks before the blast, scientists saw the rock bulge forming on the mountain's north flank. According to investigator Richard Waite, the growing bulge confused most USGS scientists. It wasn't clear what was happening. I mean, volcano spreading, what does that mean? Um, nobody knew. At first, uh, it was thought to be just the bases of the glacier melting a bit and then suddenly creeping out a lot faster than they had before. 
it took some weeks before I realized it wasn't just a glacier, it was all the rock creeping out as well. Scientists couldn't see what was happening inside the volcano, but they concluded that something was blocking the magma inside its central conduit. They believed the black magma forced its way towards the north slope of the mountain, forming the bulge. Magma was being injected inside the volcano, uh, sort of like inflating a water balloon inside of a birthday cake. If you were to put a balloon in there and then start filling it, it would fracture and parts of the cake would move and, and it would sort of swell and bulge and so forth. And that's essentially what was happening at Mount St. Helens. Most scientists believed that the rock bulge would eventually collapse in a landslide. The landslide would bring mass down from the top of the volcano and the plug blocking the central conduit would be removed. No plug would result in a vertical eruption. In fact, scientists were so confident of this theory that they went public with their prediction. They believed that the rock bulge was in all likelihood a forerunner of the long-awaited vertical eruption. But investigators Miller and Waite know that one scientist had another theory. When David Johnston first saw the Mount St. Helens rock bulge, it reminded him of a study on the 1956 eruption of Mount Bezimyani in the Soviet Union. That study documented a very rare occurrence. Rather than a classic vertical eruption, the Soviet volcano had erupted horizontally in a lateral blast. David Johnson had mentioned that there was a lot of similarities between the way Bezzi Miani had behaved in 1956 and the way this volcano, Mount St. Helens, was behaving now in March, April, 1980. Before it erupted, Bezimyani had steam explosions, earthquakes, and the development of a rock bulge. The very same things Johnston was seeing at Mount St. Helens. And in the aftermath of the blast, investigators realized that David Johnston was right. The rock bulge on Mount St. Helens was a precursor of the devastating lateral blast The decision to ignore David Johnston's idea had fatal consequences. The Forestry Commission modeled the red and blue zones on the USGS hazard map based on the worst vertical eruption Mount St. Helens had ever produced, not on the lateral blast as it happened at Besignani. Investigators now understand what happened during the blast, but they still need to find out why. For that, they need hard data. Their search for the 12 seismographs has been unsuccessful. They find five, but all are too damaged to be useful. The investigation stalls. Then, 10 days after the blast, a breakthrough. Five miles to the west of the volcano, investigators find another seismograph. And this one has survived the blast. Seismologist Steve Malone. It recorded the initial earthquake, it recorded the blast, it recorded the debris flow going by near it. It then recorded losing its antenna as a mud flow came and yanked the antenna loose. And we could see all of those sequences in the, in the seismic record that we were able to recover from the mud. Using data from the seismograph, investigators are now able to piece together a detailed timeline of exactly what happened during the eruption on May 18th.
8.32 and 20 seconds. The fragile rock bulge on the north flank of Mount St. Helens collapses, causing a massive landslide. This landslide wipes away the thin layer of rock that's holding the magma in. The magma explodes at the point of least resistance, in this case, the exposed mountain's north side. The eruption releases a superheated cloud of ash and debris that travels at over 600 miles per hour. It's kind of like a locomotive. We're moving at several hundred miles per hour, and this cloud sort of travel across country, sort of like rolling out a carpet. David Johnston is six miles from the volcano. In just 40 seconds, the surge overwhelms him. One minute later, geophysics student Keith Ronholm realizes that the blast cloud is barreling towards him and he runs for his life. After 90 seconds, the blast has passed through the red and blue zones, flattening everything in its path and smashing trees 250 feet tall to the ground. Now, at 590 miles per hour, the cloud of ash and debris powers across the landscape. Even the high ridges surrounding Danny and Brian's campsite are no match. The blast cloud reaches them in two minutes at a temperature of 300 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to boil the sap in trees and inflict second-degree burns on Danny. Ten minutes after the eruption, the heat released by the explosion melts 75% of the ice on top of Mount St. Helens. Nearly 46 billion gallons of meltwater rush into the river valley system. The team analyzes deposits of river mud up the sides of river valleys around the volcano. They discover that even three miles from the mountain, the Lahar mudslide caused by the melting volcano's glaciers is still 50 feet high. It inundates 130 miles of river valley, traveling at 30 miles per hour. It's what the lahar picks up along the way that makes it so dangerous. One torrent of mud and water overruns a logging camp on the south fork of the Toodle River Valley. It sweeps up 20,000 tree trunks. Now it heads straight for Rold Wrighton and Venus Durgan. The Lahar flow surges around the bend. Even here, 30 miles from the volcano, its force still packs a mighty punch. It only took two minutes to destroy the whole place that we were, you know, I mean, it's destroyed it. Didn't look the same after just two minutes. It was unreal. The Lahar flow fades away almost 40 miles from the mountain. In all, they destroy 27 bridges, 200 homes, and strand 31 ships on the Columbia River. USGS scientists 
accept that their model of a potential Mount St. Helens blast was wrong. The red and blue zones were modeled on a vertical eruption and not a lateral blast. But one part of their prediction was right. They sort of hit the nail on the head in terms of lahars and where they went and what their impacts were. I mean, our scientists went out and took pictures of the 21 bridges on the North Fork of the Toodle River before the event because we knew darn well that if the eruption occurred, that most of them would be gone. The USGS wanted to make 150 miles of river valleys into no-go areas, but didn't have the power to enforce it. Washington State Governor Dixie Lee Ray did, though. The USGS warned Governor Ray but she chose not to heed the warning. Why didn't she act on their advice? Before the Mount St. Helens eruption, the USGS made two major forecasts. One, that if an eruption occurred, it would be a vertical blast. And two, in a correct prediction, that an eruption would release huge mud flows that would inundate the river valley system surrounding the volcano. The USGS warned authorities. I and my colleagues were quite unhappy or at least disappointed in the fact that the state of Washington chose to ignore the USGS hazard zones on their land and, and property and not to extend the blue and red zone concept out into their own property. So on, on the morning of May 18, the air, some areas that could have been evacuated and could have been restricted um, were not. Governor Ray rejected the USGS recommendations. The logistical restraints of closing off large tracts of river at the start of the fishing season and the cost to the state and local economy were factors she had to consider. Governor Ray chose not to close the rivers. It can be done, and in times of war it is done. But we were not in a war situation, and I had to take the information that was available to me as to how much hazard, how much danger, and make a decision as to whether people uh, should be excluded from their livelihoods and from their homes. In the months after the disaster, Governor Ray was taken to court. The lawsuit alleged that the boundaries of the red and blue zones had been based on commercial reason not scientific advice. The case against Washington State was dismissed in 1985. The final cost of the disaster was an estimated $1 billion, but the toll on those affected is impossible to calculate. On the 18th of May, I, in just a matter of hours, I was the most terrified I'd ever been in my life, the most excited I'd ever been in my life, the most challenged I'd ever been in my life, okay, and, and knew that I was gonna die too. Danny Balch still lives in Washington, but the disaster continues to cast a long shadow over his daily life. More than 25 years later, he still has to take painkillers to cope with the terrible burns he suffered. He's angry that scientists didn't predict the disaster. Nobody was really told just how dangerous it was getting, just how bad the bulge was. They talked about the bulge a little bit, but they did not talk about how much the bulge was growing. Scientists maintain that in 1980, they simply didn't have the knowledge to predict the scale of the Mount St. Helens blast. 
the one thing that we were really unfamiliar with and did not anticipate was a very large scale directed blast. And the scale of the devastation was just, well, it was unprecedented, literally, <clears throat> in 40,000 years of eruptions at Mount St. Helens. The lesson at St. Helens, if nothing else, is that the worst case scenario may be exceeded. It's a sobering lesson because the worst case scenarios sometimes are pretty bad. And if they can be exceeded, you're talking serious stuff. And of course, this was. In the aftermath of the eruption, Mount St. Helens was declared a national monument and area of scientific interest. On the ridge where geologist David Johnston was killed, an observatory was erected in honor of his memory. The Johnston Ridge Observatory houses state-of-the-art monitoring equipment that continues the young geologist's pioneering work. The USGS describes the 1980 eruption as a wake-up call for volcanology. Its investigation revealed a huge amount about volcanic phenomena and transformed their ability to predict eruptions accurately. In February 2005, 25 years after the fatal Mount St. Helens eruption, geologists accurately predicted the volcano would become active again it did, but this time no lives were lost. Today, the work of USGS scientists extends far outside the US. They currently monitor 53 volcanoes worldwide, offering advice on the dangers these active peaks pose. It's only a matter of time until one of these volcanoes erupts but the work at the USGS will help ensure that those who live in the shadow of volcanoes around the world will be ready.